Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck, part 13. At 0557, one of our observers had spotted a quick spreading fire forward of Hood's aft mast. The second salvo from Prince Eugen had set fire to rocket propellant for the UP projectors. Four minutes later, a heavy salvo from Bismarck hit the hood and sent a mountain of flame and a yellowish-white fireball bursting up between her masts and soaring into the sky. White stars, probably molten pieces of metal, shot out from under the black smoke that followed the flame and huge fragments, one of which looked like a main turret, whirled through the air like toys. Wreckage of every description littered the water around Hood, one especially conspicuous piece remaining afire for a long time and giving off clouds of dense black smoke. Another observer, on duty in the chart house as an assistant to Corvettenkapitän Wolf Neuendorf, the navigator, described what he saw. Straddling, boomed out of the loudspeaker. I was standing with Kapitän Neuendorf in front of the chart on which we were continuously recording our course. We put our instruments down and hurried to the eye slits in the forward conning tower, looked through and asked ourselves, what does he mean, straddling? At first, we could see nothing. But what we saw moments later could not have been conjured up by even the wildest imagination. Suddenly, Hood split in two and thousands of tons of steel were hurled into the air. More than a thousand men died, and although the range was still about 18,000 meters, the fireball that developed where the hood still was seemed near enough to touch. It was so close that I shut my eyes, but curiosity made me open them again a second or two later. It was like being in a hurricane. Every nerve in my body felt the pressure of the explosions. If I have one wish, it is that my children may be spared such an experience. In my director I now saw the aft part of foot drift away and quickly sink. Her forward section sank slowly and soon there was nothing to be seen where the pride of the Royal Navy, the 48,000 ton mighty hood, had so suddenly suffered the fate Admiral Holland had in mind for the two German ships. From the time the firing began, only six minutes passed before a shell from Bismarck penetrated the hood's armor protection at a point never definitely established and detonated more than 100 tons of cordite in the ammunition room of one of her aft main turrets. How reminiscent of what happened to the battlecruiser Queen Mary, indefatigable and invincible at the Battle of Jutland in 1916. Hood met her end in the midst of battle. She left only three survivors in the ice-cold waters and they were picked up by a British destroyer and landed at Reykjavik. At their battle stations, our men were kept informed of the course of the action by the ship's watch. They heard, enemy in sight, opponent has opened fire. They waited to hear the response of our own guns, and a few minutes later it came and each salvo made the ship shudder. Salvo after salvo was leaving Bismarck's guns and her engines were running smoothly when the men below heard, hood is burning, and a little later, hood is exploding. They just stared at one another in disbelief. Then the shock passed and the jubilation knew no bounds. Overwhelmed with joy and pride in the victory, they slapped one another on the back and shook hands. In the damage control center adjacent to the command center, the first officer's action station, Josef Stadz saw a more exuberant Earls than he would have believed possible. Earls thrust the top half of his body through the pass-through between the two centers and, thrilled to the core, shouted, A triple Z Kyle to our Bismarck! The superiors had a hard time getting the men back to work and convincing them that the battle wasn't over and that every man must continue to do his duty. When Hood had gone, our heavy guns were ordered to shift to left target. That meant combining our fire with that of Prince Eugen, which, along with our own medium guns, had been firing at this target for some minutes. The Prince of Wales, which, in obedience to Admiral Holland's last command, was turning 20 degrees to port when Hood blew up, had to change direction to avoid the wreckage of her vanished leader. She was then at approximately the same range and on the same course as Hood had been. Consequently, Schneider could continue the action without adjusting firing data. Because our courses were converging, the range soon closed to 14,000 meters and Prince of Wales was being fired upon by both German ships. By this time, I was back watching for a torpedo attack from the Northwark and Suffolk, listening over the telephone to Schneider's firing directions. The action did not last much longer. 
Clearly, it was telling on the Prince of Wales and she turned away to the southeast, laying down a smokescreen to cover her withdrawal. When the range increased to 22,000 meters, Lutyens gave the command to cease firing on the Prince of Wales. She too must have been hard hit. How hard, we had no way of knowing at the time. Nevertheless, I will tell here what we learned later. Prince of Wales took four 38cm hits from Bismarck and three 20.3cm hits from Prince Eugene. One 38cm shell struck her bridge and killed everyone there except the captain and the chief signal petty officer. Another put her forward fire control stations for the secondary battery out of action and a third hit her aircraft crane. Number 4 penetrated below the waterline, did not explode and came to rest near one of her generator rooms. Two 20.3cm shells went through her hull below the waterline aft, letting in some 600 tons of water which flooded several aft starboard compartments, including a shaft alley. The third entered the shell handling room of a 13.3cm gun and came to rest there without exploding. One of the crew of this mount instantly carried the shell to the railing and threw it overboard. Besides the damage done by these hits, the Prince of Wales was suffering from increasingly frequent trouble with her main turrets, which had been in operation for only two months so that she was able to get off scarcely a salvo with its full load of shells. It was in the stars that the shell that struck the bridge of the Prince of Wales would not explode until it had passed through, a fact that later brought me the friendship of one of its victims. Lieutenant Esmond Knight, Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve, an actor by profession and a painter and ornithologist by avocation, was keeping lookout through a pair of German Zeiss binoculars. His station was in the unarmored anti-aircraft fire control position above the bridge and he was protected only by his steel helmet. He heard something like a violently onrushing cyclone and then someone said, Stretcher here, make way! He had the feeling that he was surrounded by corpses and he smelled blood. People were approaching him and asking, what happened to you? He looked in the direction of the voices and saw nothing. A shell splinter had blinded him. In 1948, after a visitor to Germany brought me greetings from him, he wrote to me. He said, I was blind for a year, but now I am back in my old profession at the theater, which makes me very happy. In 1957, I was a surprise guest in the episode of the BBC's television program, This Is Your Life, that was devoted to Esmond Knight. That is when we met for the first time and we have been friends ever since. But back to Bismarck. Today I greatly regret that, especially from this time forward, I was not a party to Lütjen's deliberations, his conferences within the fleet staff and his conversations with Lindemann and did not even have any means of hearing about them secondhand. Nothing of them reached me in the aft fire control station and I can only record the statements of survivors to the effect that Lutyens and Lindemann had a difference of opinion regarding breaking off the action with Prince of Wales. Apparently Lindemann wanted to pursue and destroy the obviously hearted enemy and Lutyens rejected the idea. Lutyens may have feared that if he continued the action he would be drawn in a direction from which other heavy British units might be advancing. German aerial reconnaissance had not, at that time, provided him with accurate information on the disposition of the British home fleet, therefore he would be running the risk of getting into more action, using up more ammunition and, of course, having his own ships damaged, none of which were prospects he could have welcomed in view of his principal mission, which was war against British trade. He would have viewed it as necessary to forego the destruction of another British battleship, which must have been tempting to him also but the chances are that his reserve prevented him from explaining his decisions to Lindemann. Differences of opinion generally result in arguments and, according to one survivor, there was an argument between Lucien's and Lindemann about breaking off the action. It is not clear what the survivor meant by an argument, but it is highly unlikely that there were loud words in the presence of third parties. In view of the personalities of the men involved, it seemed certain that whatever took place would have been conducted with military formality. The only thing definite about this is that someone overheard an officer of the fleet staff telling Fregattenkapitän Oels over the telephone that apparently Lindemann had tried to persuade Lütjens to pursue Prince of Wales. According to other reports, there was heavy weather on the bridge for a while. It seems likely that the argument was more evident in the atmosphere than in an exchange of words. In any event, the men below found it absolutely incomprehensible that, after the destruction of Hood, we did not go after Prince of Wales. They were upset and disappointed. 
Upon the report of the Battle of Iceland, Hitler expressed himself to the same effect. If now, he said to his retinue, these British cruisers are maintaining contact and Lütjens has sunk hood and nearly crippled the other, which was brand new and having trouble with her guns during the action, why didn't he sink her too? Why hasn't he tried to get out of there and why hasn't he turned around? That's really what he was thinking of. But then he would have run into the arms of the home fleet. The Battle of Iceland was over and we had used astonishing little ammunition. Bismarck's 38cm guns had fired only 93 shells and Prince Eugen's 20.3cm guns had fired 179. Many shells fell close to the Prince, but she was not hit. Bismarck received three 35.6cm hits. My action station was high up and in the tumult of the battle I was not aware of any incoming hits, but the men in the spaces below found them easily distinguishable from the firing of our own guns. Suddenly. A petty officer wrote of our first hit from Prince of Wales. He sensed a different jolt, a different tremor through the body of our ship. It was a hit, the first hit. That first hit, forward of the armored transverse bulkhead in the fossil, passed completely through the ship from port to starboard above the waterline but below the bow wave. It damaged the bulkheads between compartments 20 and 21 and compartments 21 and 22 and left a one and a half meter hole in the exit side. It also ripped up several wing and double bottom tanks. Before long, we had nearly 2000 tons of seawater in our fossil. The second hit stuck beneath the armored belt alongside compartment 14 and exploded against the torpedo bulkhead. It caused flooding of the forward port generator room and power station number 4 and shattered the bulkheads between that room and the two adjacent ones, the port number 2 boiler room and the auxiliary boiler room. Later, it was discovered that this hit had also ripped up several of the fuel tanks in the storage and double bottom. The third shell severed the forepost of one of our service boats, then splashed into the water to starboard without exploding or doing any other apparent damage. The crew of an unarmored anti-aircraft gun nearby was very lucky, although the hit sent splinters of the boat flying in every direction, none of them were injured. Happily, no one was hurt by any of the hits we took at this time. Our damage control parties and machinery repair teams made a detailed inspection of the damage that had been done by the two serious hits and set about making what repairs they could. Forward, the anchor windless room was unusable and the lower decks between compartments 20 and 21 were flooded. Consequently, the bulkhead between compartment 20 was being subjected not only to the pressure of static water but, on account of the big hole in our hull, to that created by our forward motion. To keep it from giving way, a master carpenter's team shored it up while the action was still going on. After the action, a work party led by the second damage control officer, Oberleutnant Karl Ludwig Richter, attempted to enter the forward pumping station through the fossil in order to repair the pumps so that the contents of the forward fuel storage tanks could be transferred to the service tanks near the boiler rooms. But the pumps in compartment 20 were underwater and those in compartment 17 did not help much. Also, the valves and the oil lines in the fossil were no longer serviceable. When an effort to divert the oil via the upper deck also failed, we realized that the 1000 tons of fuel in the forward tanks were not going to be of any use to us. Lütjens turned down Lindemann's suggestions of healing the ship first to one side and then the other and reducing speed in order to allow the holes in our hull to be patched. Later, however, we did slow to 22 knots for a while, which at least allowed matting to be placed over the holes and the flow of water into the ship was reduced. Eventually, we had to shut down power station number 4 and compartment 14. We still had sufficient energy for all our action stations, but our 100% reserve capacity was cut in half. The damage repair parties stuffed the shattered bulkheads in the port number 2 boiler room and the auxiliary boiler room with hammocks to keep the water in check. Oberleutnant Richter was again on the scene, the never out of sorts officer who always had a good word for everyone, together with his warrant officer Carpenter. Both of them were the best pair of damage control men in the entire ship. Yet, in spite of all they could do to seal the bulkhead, the water level rose throughout the day until Richter was standing in it up to his chest and the boiler had to be shut down. As a result of the flooding, Bismarck was down 3 degrees by the bow and had a 9 degree list to port. The tips of the blades of her starboard propeller were already turning above water. The leader of damage control team number one, Stabs Obermachinist Wilhelm Schmidt, was ordered to flood the flooding and trimming tanks in compartments one and three, and this improved the situation somewhat. 
The lasting effect of the hits in compartments 14 and 21 was that, mainly because of water pressure on the forward bulkheads, our top speed was restricted to 28 knots. We were now leaving a broad streak of oil in our wake, which was undoubtedly going to help the enemy's reconnaissance and pursuit. The oil was leaking from the service tanks in compartment 14 and possibly also from the storage tanks in compartments 20 and 21. After the all clear was sounded around 0830, the off-duty officers assembled in the wardroom to congratulate our first gunnery officer on the sinking of Hood. Schneider was his friendly and unassuming self as we gathered around to empty a glass of champagne in his honor. His brilliant success made us forget for a few minutes any worries we had about Suffolk and Norfolk hanging on to us and the hits we had suffered. None of us grasped the gravity of the damage we had sustained and certainly no one suspected that this would be our last big gathering in the wardroom during Exercise Rhine. Quite obviously, Bismarck was holding her breakout course into the Atlantic and those of us assembled had no reason to think that our operation would not continue according to plan. If anyone doubted the correctness of the fleet commander's decision to go on, he did not say so. At 0632, the battle being over, Lütjens reported to Group North, Battlecruiser, probably Hood, sunk. Another battleship, King George V or Renown, turned away damaged. Two heavy cruisers maintain contact. Atmospheric conditions in the waters off Greenland were so poor that this message was not received in Wilhelmshaven until 1326. When the minutes passed and it was not acknowledged, Lütjens had it repeated continually. At 0705, he enlarged upon it in a brief report, which also failed to reach Group North. It said, have sunk a battleship at approximately 63 degrees 10 minutes north, 32 degrees west. At 0801, Lütjens advised the Seekriegsleitung of the damage he had received, adding, Denmark Strait, 50 nautical miles wide, floating mines, enemy two radars and, intention, to proceed to Saint-Nazaire, Prince Eugen, to conduct cruiser warfare. The dispatch of this third radio signal at 0801 on May the 24th shows that within an hour or so after the action of Iceland, Lütjens had decided to make for Saint-Nazaire. Interestingly, that was too soon for him to have had a complete picture of the damage Bismarck had suffered or, most importantly, of what shipboard repairs we would be able to make. The time of his signal shows further that even as we in the wardroom were rejoicing in the assumption that the operation would continue as planned, he had already informed Seekriegsleitung that such was not his intention. Not until noon, when we changed course from southwest to south, did the news go around, to the officer's considerable surprise. And Exercise Rhine has to be aborted with Bismarck turning back towards France, which I think is a good point to conduct the after-action report. Uh, this time we've learned about the damage taken by the different ships and I will put up the ship images with the hits again. Hood herself was discussed at length in the last episode, so I will skip her this time. Prince of Wales took considerable damage and only through sheer luck wasn't sunk. Uh, one 203mm shell penetrated into a gunnery space where live shells were handled and had it exploded, the consequences surely would have been catastrophic. The hit that Prince of Wales took to the bridge was quite devastating on the other hand, and even though the 15-inch shell fired by Bismarck did not explode, it is still a 1,800-pound projectile, traveling at over 2,600 feet per second. At the muzzle, this equates to a kinetic energy of 270 megajoules, which, for your frame of reference, is about the same kinetic energy of an EMD DDA-40X diesel-electric locomotive traveling at 100 miles per hour. Imagine this coming at you at this kind of speed. Uh, there are reports of crewmen directly below the bridge in the map room where after the hit there was blood dripping down through the speaking tubes and onto the maps. This was, as they say, a quite significant emotional event. It is notable at this point um, to comment on accuracy of fire. In almost all the reports the accuracy of the German gunnery was commended by the British. Uh, immediately after the loss of foot, it is described as extreme and in other reports it is said that the small size of the enemy spreads was remarkable. You can see this when looking at the hits received by Prince of Wales. Then we have the damage taken by Bismarck and the hits are again on screen for your consideration. The most damaging was the one on the bow, which caused flooding and made some 1000 tons of fuel unusable and also forced the captain to slow down. It is one piece in the puzzle of events that would lead to the sinking later. But for now, Bismarck has turned away to France. 
And finally, I find it quite endearing to see the picture of Burkhardt and Esmond together, having drinks and smiling years after being involved in this battle. We've seen this many times in the European theatre, the most famous example probably being Charlie Brown and Franz Stiegler. Franz uh, Stiegler escorted a badly shot up B-17 back to the English Channel in his ME-109, saving Charlie Brown's life and the life of his crew. They too became friends later in life and coincidentally, Franz flew an ME-109 marked Yellow 2, which is the same marking that the protagonist in another story on this channel flew into battle. You can check it out if you like. Burkhardt will return on Bismarck next Tuesday and I will see you then. Remember to like, comment, subscribe. Cheers, bye bye.